on World News Tonight. Supporting Ukraine, G7 leaders tighten their grip against Russia as they promise to stand by Ukraine. Missile attack, President Zelensky calling the number of casualties unimaginable as Russia strikes again. Rights battle, the political divide deepening across the United States following a Roe v. Wade reversal. And it's Boy Boomer. Celebrating the colour, music and tradition of local folklore begins as festivities return to Brazil. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, the G7 leaders are pushing the idea of capping the price they pay for Russian oil and gas, effectively forcing Moscow to choose whether to supply at a discount or to cut off the revenue stream of its pipelines. This comes as the leaders of the Group of Seven vow to stand with Ukraine. G7 leaders pledged support for Ukraine on Monday and agreed to hike sanctions on Russia as the first working day of the summit got underway. A White House fact sheet said the leaders would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes by cranking up sanctions on Russia over its war in the country, adding that they would continue to provide financial, humanitarian, military and diplomatic support. A senior U.S. official said the G7 leaders will commit to a new package of coordinated actions meant to raise pressure on Russia on Tuesday, as well as finalise plans for a price cap on Russian oil. The statement came after Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke to the leaders via video link. He asked the leaders for a broad range of military, economic and diplomatic support, according to a European official adding that he wanted the war to end by winter. However, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who is hosting the summit in Bavaria, urged caution over the sanctions. The White House also said Russia had defaulted on its foreign sovereign bonds for the first time in decades, an assertion Moscow rejects. Sanctions have effectively cut Russia out of the global financial system. But the war has created difficulties for countries way beyond Russia's borders, with curtailed food and energy supplies hitting the global economy. These also include Ukrainian grain exports now trapped in ports, which normally feed millions of people across the Middle East, Africa and elsewhere. G7 leaders are expected to discuss options for tackling rising energy prices and replacing Russian oil and gas imports, as well as further sanctions that do not exacerbate inflation. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky denounced a missile strike on a crowded mall in the city of Kremenchuk as a brazen terrorist act as the death toll rose to at least 13. G7 leaders promised to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, while the U.S. said it was close to finalizing a weapons package for Kyiv. More than 1,000 people were inside this shopping mall when it came under attack. Now this is what's left of it. Reduced to rubble, Ukrainian officials say, by a Russian missile strike. Moscow has yet to comment, but it has always denied deliberately targeting civilians. Rescuers say they have no idea how many people could be trapped under the wreckage, but they fear the death toll could be high. Reacting on social media, Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, said it was impossible to imagine the number of victims. The mall had no strategic value, he said, and was only filled by people trying to live a normal life. He added that it was useless to hope for humanity from Russia. And the UN has also weighed in, calling the attack deplorable. Any sort of civilian infrastructure, which includes obviously shopping malls and civilians, should never ever be targeted. The shopping mall is located in Kremenchuk, a city in central Ukraine, which is also home to the country's biggest oil refinery. Other cities have also been struck by missiles in recent days, including the port city of Odessa. Local police have released this footage, which they say shows the aftermath of a missile attack on a residential area. The ceiling fell on me. I didn't understand what it was. I jumped off the sofa and saw that the doors were missing and that there's no house anymore. 
I looked into the window and saw a neighbor's house on fire. On Sunday, a missile slammed into an apartment block in Kyiv, whilst another one landed close to a nursery. At least one person died in the first major attack on the capital for three weeks. Russia missed a deadline for making bond payments over the weekend, a move signaling its first default on the international debt in more than a century after Western sanctions thwarted the government's efforts to pay foreign investors. The lapse adds to the efforts to seal Moscow off from global capital markets for years. Russia has defaulted on its foreign sovereign bonds for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution over a century ago. Some bondholders said Monday that they had not received overdue interest payments. The deadline for making those payments passed a day earlier. Russia has struggled to keep up payments on $40 billion in outstanding bonds since sanctions were imposed on it over the war in Ukraine. The Kremlin says it's not for lack of money. It blames restrictions that make it impossible to send payments to bondholders. Moscow accuses the West of trying to drive it into an artificial default. Since late May, the US Treasury Department has effectively blocked Russia from making international payments. For now, any default will be largely symbolic, though. Russia can't borrow internationally at the moment, and doesn't need to thanks to plentiful oil and gas revenues. However, the stigma of default is likely to raise its borrowing costs in the future. The payments in question now concern $100 million in interest on two bonds. A grace period for the overdue payments expired Sunday. A US official said Monday that the default showed how severely sanctions were affecting Russia. Now, five days after an earthquake killed over a thousand people in southeastern Afghanistan, the survivors are trying to organize themselves. Afghanistan's health ministry and th said that thousands of people needed clean water, food and shelter. Days after a massive earthquake killed more than a thousand people in eastern Afghanistan, survivors have been busy salvaging what's left of their belongings. Last Wednesday's quake struck some of the most remote parts of the country, which has made reaching those affected all the more hard. Deep in the mountains in Paktika province, Minagal is one of those struggling to rebuild his life. Our home has been destroyed. The women and children are here with me. We have no home, no tent, and we have not received any tents so far. Women and children are living outside among the destruction. There aren't any toilets nor anything else. This is no place for us to live. Afghanistan's health ministry says thousands of people are in need of clean water and food. The UN has warned that cholera outbreaks are of particular and serious concern. The situation is a real test for the Taliban, who seized control of the country last year following the withdrawal of US-led international forces. The hardline group has since been shunned by many foreign governments due to concerns about human rights. On the ground, the people of Afghanistan are looking to their leaders for help. The United Nations and several other countries have rushed aid to the affected areas. More is due to arrive over the coming days. Meanwhile, Afghan authorities are calling on international governments to roll back sanctions. They also want the freeze on billions of dollars in central bank assets stashed in Western financial institutions to be lifted. NATO has been stepping up engagement with its four Asia-Pacific partners, South Korea, Japan, Australia and New Zealand, this time by inviting them to the 2022 summit in Madrid. Experts say the move by NATO is an attempt to counter China and its growing threats on the wide global stage. The 2022 NATO summit may be another sign of Atlantic Pacific nations teaming up against the bellicose challenge of Russia, and particularly in the growing global assertiveness of China. By inviting South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand as Asia-Pacific partners, the U.S. is once again making use of NATO to keep Beijing in check. In fact, NATO's new strategic concept is set to include the very first mention of China and its threats, a clear indication that China issues will no doubt tap this year's agenda. Another expert points out that South Korea's debut at the Global Military Alliance also comes in a timely manner. Economically, the U.S. has brought South Korea into China issues with IPEF, but politically, Seoul cannot join the Quad for now, so the Biden administration has invited South Korea 
citing global security reasons. That also falls in line with the Yoon Sogir administration's pursuit of beefing up comprehensive security networks with its partners. Plus, Yoon's presence at NATO will serve as a perfect opportunity for Seoul to drum up international cooperation on North Korea issues, especially the regime's latest nuclear threats. The Biden administration has been upfront that the participation of Indo-Pacific nations at NATO directly targets China. And with Seoul's ambitious goal of strengthening value solidarity based on a liberal democracy, South Korea is expected to play along with Washington's stance. But watchers also caution against the possibility of retaliatory action by Beijing on Seoul, even in a discreet manner, such as during the diesel exhaust fluid shortage in South Korea, which stemmed from China's suspension of urea exports. Let's go into short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now we're moving on to our neighboring India. At least one person was killed and around 20 trapped after a four-story building collapsed in the western Mumbai suburb. And on the other hand, the extreme weather conditions are affecting the nation as well. To get more details on these devastating floods, let's cross over to other than a World News special correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekar, who joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri. Yes, Shenali. Flood victims stranded in the Nagaland district of India's Assam region received food aid from district authorities after their houses were washed away. The Deputy Commissioner of Nagaland, Nizak Hivare, who visited the crisis hit area along with a team of rescuers, said some relief material had been distributed to the residents of the district. Houses and temples were submerged in the Nagaland district and the authorities have travelled to affected areas in inflatable boards in an effort to provide rice and wheat to the stranded villagers. Resident, residents waded through uh, flooded roads in the se uh, severely affected South Assam city of Sinshar, which has also been waterlogged for over a week. Some districts in the state have been ravaged flood since April, killing over 100 people so far. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharan, a World News Special Correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekar, reporting from Delhi in India. President Joe Biden's administration indicated it will seek to prevent states from banning a pill used for medicating abortion in light of the U.S. Supreme Court overturning the landmark Roe v. Wade ruling, signaling a major new legal fight. The next U.S. abortion battle is over pills, and it's already begun. In the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court upending 50 years of precedent and overturning the constitutional right to obtain an abortion, the Democratic administration of President Joe Biden indicated it will fight to keep legal a pill used for what's known as medication abortion. Today, I'm directing the Department of Health and Human Services to take steps to ensure these critical medications are available to the fullest extent possible. The administration could argue in court that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's approval of mifepristone, one of the pills used for medication abortions, preempts state restrictions, meaning federal authority outweighs any state action. Attorney General Merrick Garland, in a statement last week, made the administration's view explicit, quote, states may not ban mifepristone based on disagreement with the FDA's expert judgment about its safety and efficacy. Mifepristone was approved for use in abortions by the FDA in 2000. The pill, also known as RU486, blocks the pregnancy-sustaining hormone progesterone, while the other drug used, misoprostol, induces uterine contractions. In Texas, which enacted what was in effect a near-total ban prior to the ruling, one woman who spoke to Reuters earlier this year and asked not to be named said it took two rounds of self-administered abortion medication to terminate her pregnancy. It was extremely painful the second time around. Um, probably the most pain I'd ever experienced in my life. Um, because I was self-managing this, I had limited access to pain management. Um, and I was lucky that when we made it to the four hour, 45 minute mark, the cramps subsided, I passed the pregnancy. Dr. Adam Jacobs at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital said that in the wake of the latest ruling, many will be confused as to what they can do within the law. 
Leading Democrats have called on Biden to do more to protect abortion rights nationwide. Two progressive lawmakers, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, urged Biden to use federal land as a safe haven for abortion in states that ban or severely restrict the practice. Georgia Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams urged Democrats in Congress to codify Roe v. Wade into law by casting aside the U.S. Senate filibuster rule that enabled Republicans to block such an effort last month. A leak of toxic chlorine gas at Jordan's Red Sea port of Aqaba has killed 13 people and injured more than 260 others. The leak came after a tank filled with 25 tons of chlorine gas being exported to Djibouti fell while being transported. 12 people are dead tonight after a massive explosion and toxic gas leak at a Jordanian port. According to the Jordanian government, a crane was loading chlorine tanks onto a ship when one of them was dropped as a result of a crane malfunction. Video shows the moment a cloud of yellow gas spread to cover the dock, sending workers running for their lives. If it was a small amount of chlorine, the irritation it will subside. However, if they are exposed to a significant amount of chlorine gas, they may develop a, a number of symptoms, including something resembling asthma, for example, and pulmonary fibrosis in the long term. More than 260 people were injured, according to the government release. A state-funded outlet, Al Mamlika TV, reporting 199 people were being treated in hospitals. Aqaba is on the northern tip of the Red Sea, next to the Israeli city of Eilat, which is just across the border. The nearest residences are 15 miles away, but a local health official urged people to stay inside and close their windows and doors. 15 miles is a sufficient far enough distance, so the people should not develop severe injury. But my recommendation will be to be inside, to remain inside until the all clear has been issued by the health authorities. The country's media minister says the situation is, quote, under control. The prime minister saying he assembled the team to find out exactly what happened. Photos from Jordan Public Security show laboratory teams on site to collect evidence. The prime minister adding, quote, I salute all the working cadres from the specialized agencies for the speedy response to the Aqaba incident, which reduced the severity of the injuries we witnessed. Growing interest in public health as well as that of the environment has led to greater interest in meat alternatives. A study in South Korea shows some products have higher protein content than beef. This is a restaurant for vegans. It serves steak and burgers made of beans, but the flavor and texture are very similar to the real thing. I made the patties by implementing high moisture manufacturing technology using soybean protein and tried to bring out the flavor of meat by using charcoal and rice straw. The Korea Consumer Agency recently studied 15 plant-based meat alternatives and found that the ones that are cholesterol-free actually had higher protein ratios than real beef hamburger patties. However, it was also found that four products had relatively high saturated fat ratios due to the process of making them juicy, and three products contained excessive sodium in their seasoning. Moreover, all 15 products were meant to be plant-based or vegan, but some contained egg, which vegans cannot eat. There are currently no clear regulations regarding food types or standards for plant-based meat alternatives in South Korea. To guarantee consumer choice, it's necessary to have a set of labeling standards regarding ingredients and manufacturing for meat alternatives. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is preparing to release guidelines within this year for meat alternatives. The Korea Consumer Agency has also decided to make requests to the relevant ministries for meat alternative standards. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A 
appealing to governments around the world at the United Nations Ocean Conference, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres asked for more efforts to save the world's dying oceans. In the U.S. state of Missouri, an Amtrak train carrying 243 passengers and 12 crew has derailed. The train was traveling from Los Angeles to Chicago when it hit a dump truck at a rail crossing. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a Washington State Public School District violated the rights of a Christian high school football coach who was suspended for refusing to stop leading prayers with players on the field after games. A bridge in Turkey's Black Sea region collapsed under the weight of a rushing stream after heavy rainfall caused flooding in six provinces. The Disaster and Emergency Management Presidency announced 235 citizens were evacuated from three provinces. Google faces an antitrust complaint by Danish online job search rival Job Index, which told European Union regulators the alphabet-owned business had allegedly unfairly favoured its own job search service. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at the Boy Boomba Festival, yet another major festival happening this week in the Amazon rainforest. Stay safe and have a good night.